Chapter 1, Summary and Conclusions, The Assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy on November 22, 1963, was a cruel and shocking act of violence directed against a man, a family, a nation, and against all mankind. A young and vigorous leader whose years of public and private life stretched before him was the victim of the fourth presidential assassination in the history of a country dedicated to the concepts of reasoned argument and peaceful political change. This commission was created on November 29, 1963, in recognition of the right of people everywhere to full and truthful knowledge concerning these events. This report endeavors to fulfill that right and to appraise this tragedy by the light of reason and the standard of fairness. It has been prepared with a deep awareness of the Commission's responsibility to present to the American people an objective report of the facts relating to the assassination. Narrative of Events At 11.40 a.m. Central Standard Time on Friday, November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy Mrs. Kennedy and their party arrived at Love Field, Dallas, Texas. Behind them was the first day of a Texas trip planned five months before by the President, Vice President, Lyndon B. Johnson, and John B. Connolly, Jr., Governor of Texas. After leaving the White House on Thursday morning, the President had flown initially to San Antonio, where Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson joined the party and the President dedicated new research facilities at the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine. Following a testimonial dinner in Houston for U.S. Representative Albert Thomas, the President flew to Fort Worth, where he spent the night and spoke at a large breakfast gathering on Friday. Planned for later that day were a motorcade through downtown Dallas, a luncheon speech at the Trademark, and a flight to Austin where the President would attend a reception and speak at a Democratic fundraising dinner. From Austin, he would proceed to the Texas ranch of the Vice President. Evident on this trip were the varied roles which an American President performs, head of state, chief executive, party leader, and, in this instance, prospective candidate for re-election. The Dallas motorcade, it was hoped, would evoke a demonstration of the President's personal popularity in a city which he had lost in the 1960 election. Once it had been decided that the trip to Texas would span two days, those responsible for planning, primarily Governor Connolly and Kenneth O'Donnell, a special assistant to the President, agreed that a motorcade through Dallas would be desirable. The Secret Service was told on November 8th that 45 minutes had been allotted to a motorcade procession from Love Field to the site of a luncheon planned by Dallas business and civic leaders in honor of the President. After considering the facilities and security problems of several buildings, the trademark was chosen as the luncheon site. Given this selection, in accordance with the customary practice of affording the greatest number of people an opportunity to see the President, the motorcade route selected was a natural one. The route was approved by the local host committee and White House representatives on November 18th and publicized in the local papers starting on November 19th. This advanced publicity made it clear that the motorcade would leave Main Street and pass the intersection of Elm and Houston Streets as it proceeded to the trademark by way of the Stemmons Freeway. By mid-morning of November 22nd, clearing skies in Dallas dispelled the threat of rain and the President greeted the crowds from his open limousine without the bubble top, which was at the time a plastic shield furnishing protection only against inclement weather. To the left of the President in the rear seat was Mrs. Kennedy. In the jump seats were Governor Connolly, who was in front of the President, and Mrs. Connolly at the Governor's left. Agent William R. Greer of the Secret Service was driving, and Agent Roy H. Kellerman was sitting to his right. Directly behind the presidential limousine was an open follow-up car with eight Secret Service agents, two in the front seat, two in the rear, and two on each running board. 
These agents, in accordance with normal Secret Service procedures, were instructed to scan the crowds, the roofs, and windows of buildings, overpasses, and crossings for signs of trouble. Behind the follow-up car was the vice presidential car carrying the vice president and Mrs. Johnson and Senator Ralph W. Yarborough. Next were a vice presidential follow-up car and several cars and buses for additional dignitaries, press representatives, and others. The motorcade left Love Field shortly after 11.50 a.m. and proceeded through residential neighborhoods, stopping twice at the President's request to greet well-wishers among the friendly crowds. Each time the President's car halted, Secret Service agents from the follow-up car moved forward to assume a protective stance near the President and Mrs. Kennedy. As the motorcade reached Main Street, a principal east-west artery in downtown Dallas, the welcome became tumultuous. At the extreme west end of Main Street, the motorcade turned right onto Houston Street and proceeded north for one block in order to make a left turn on Elm Street, the most direct and convenient approach to the Stemmons Freeway and the trademark. As the President's car approached the intersection of Houston and Elm Streets, there loomed directly ahead on the intersection's northwest corner a seven-story orange brick warehouse and office building, the Texas School Book Depository. Riding in the Vice President's car, Agent Rufus W. Youngblood of the Secret Service noticed that the clock atop the building indicated 12.30 p.m., the scheduled arrival time at the trademark. The President's car, which had been going north, made a sharp turn toward the southwest onto Elm Street. At a speed of about 11 miles per hour, it started down the gradual descent toward a railroad overpass under which the motorcade would proceed before reaching the Stemmons Freeway. The front of the Texas School Book Depository was now on the President's right, and he waved to the crowd assembled there as he passed the building. Dealey Plaza, an open landscaped area marking the western end of downtown Dallas, stretched out to the President's left. A Secret Service agent riding in the motorcade radioed the trademark that the President would arrive in five minutes. Seconds later, shots resounded in rapid succession. The President's hand moved to his neck. He appeared to stiffen momentarily and lurch slightly forward in his seat. A bullet had entered the base of the back of his neck, slightly to the right of the spine. It traveled downward and exited from the front of the neck, causing a nick in the left lower portion of the knot in the president's necktie. Before the shooting started, Governor Connolly had been facing toward the crowd on the right. He started to turn toward the left and suddenly felt a blow on his back. The governor had been hit by a bullet which entered at the extreme right side of his back at a point below his right armpit. The bullet traveled through his chest in a downward and forward direction, exited below his right nipple, passed through his right wrist, which had been in his lap, and then caused a wound to his left thigh. The force of the bullet's impact appeared to spin the governor to his right, and Mrs. Connolly pulled him down into her lap. Another bullet then struck President Kennedy in the rear portion of his head, causing a massive and fatal wound. The president fell to the left into Mrs. Kennedy's lap. Secret Service agent Clinton J. Hill, riding on the left running board of the follow-up car, heard a noise which sounded like a firecracker and saw the president suddenly lean forward and to the left. Hill jumped off the car and raced toward the president's limousine. In the front seat of the vice presidential car, Agent Youngblood heard an explosion and noticed unusual movements in the crowd. He vaulted into the rear seat and sat on the vice president in order to protect him. At the same time, Agent Kellerman, in the front seat of the presidential limousine, turned to observe the president. Seeing that the president was struck, Kellerman instructed the driver, Let's get out of here. We are hit. He radioed ahead to the lead car. Get us to the hospital immediately. Agent Greer immediately accelerated the presidential car. As it gained speed, 
Agent Hill managed to pull himself onto the back of the car where Mrs. Kennedy had climbed. Hill pushed her back into the rear seat and shielded the stricken President and Mrs. Kennedy as the President's car proceeded at high speed to Parkland Memorial Hospital, four miles away. At Parkland, the President was immediately treated by a team of physicians who had been alerted for the President's arrival by the Dallas Police Department as the result of a radio message from the motorcade after the shooting. The doctors noted irregular breathing movements and a possible heartbeat, although they could not detect a pulse beat. They observed the extensive wound in the president's head and a small wound approximately one-fourth inch in diameter in the lower third of his neck. In an effort to facilitate breathing, the physicians performed a tracheotomy by enlarging the throat wound and inserting a tube. Totally absorbed in the immediate task of trying to preserve the president's life, the attending doctors never turned the president over for an examination of his back. At 1 p.m., after all heart activity ceased and the last rites were administered by a priest, President Kennedy was pronounced dead. Governor Connolly underwent surgery and ultimately recovered from his serious wounds. Upon learning of the President's death, Vice President Johnson left Parkland Hospital under close guard and proceeded to the presidential plane at Love Field. Mrs. Kennedy, accompanying her husband's body, boarded the plane shortly thereafter. At 2.38 p.m. in the central compartment of the plane, Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States by Federal District Court Judge Sarah T. Hughes. The plane left immediately for Washington, D.C., arriving at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, at 5.58 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. The President's body was taken to the National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, Maryland, where it was given a complete pathological examination. The autopsy disclosed the large head wound observed at Parkland and the wound in the front of the neck, which had been enlarged by the Parkland doctors when they performed the tracheotomy. Both of these wounds were described in the autopsy report as being presumably of exit. In addition, the autopsy revealed a small wound of entry in the rear of the president's skull and another wound of entry near the base of the back of the neck. The autopsy report stated the cause of death as gunshot wound head, and the bullets which struck the president were described as having been fired from a point behind and somewhat above the level of the deceased. At the scene of the shooting, there was evident confusion at the outset concerning the point of origin of the shots. Witnesses differed in their accounts of the direction from which the sound of the shots emanated. Within a few minutes, however, attention centered on the Texas School Book Depository building as the source of the shots. The building was occupied by a private corporation, the Texas School Book Depository Company which distributed school textbooks of several publishers and leased space to representatives of the publishers. Most of the employees in the building worked for these publishers. The balance, including a 15-man warehousing crew, were employees of the Texas School Book Depository Company itself. Several eyewitnesses in front of the building reported that they saw a rifle being fired from the southeast corner window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. One eyewitness, Howard L. Brennan, had been watching the parade from a point on Elm Street directly opposite and facing the building. He promptly told a policeman that he had seen a slender man about 5 feet 10 inches in his early 30s take deliberate aim from the 6th floor corner window and fire a rifle in the direction of the president's car. Brennan thought he might be able to identify the man since he had noticed him in the window a few minutes before the motorcade made the turn onto Elm Street. At 12.34 p.m., the Dallas police radio mentioned the depository building as a possible source of the shots, and at 12.45 p.m., the police radio broadcast a description of the suspected assassin based primarily on Brennan's observations. When the shots were fired, 
a Dallas motorcycle patrolman, Marion L. Baker, was riding in the motorcade at a point several cars behind the president. He had turned right from Main Street onto Houston Street and was about 200 feet south of Elm Street when he heard his shot. Baker, having recently returned from a week of deer hunting, was certain the shot came from a high-powered rifle. He looked up and saw pigeons scattering in the air from their perches on the Texas School Book Depository building. He raced his motorcycle to the building, dismounted, scanned the area to the west, and pushed his way through the spectators towards the entrance. There he encountered Roy Truly, the building superintendent, who offered Baker his help. They entered the building and ran toward the two elevators in the rear. Finding that both elevators were on an upper floor, they dashed up the stairs. Not more than two minutes had elapsed since the shooting. When they reached the second floor landing on their way up to the top of the building, Patrolman Baker thought he caught a glimpse of someone through the small glass window and the door separating the hall area near the stairs from the small vestibule leading into the lunchroom. Gun in hand, he rushed to the door and saw a man about 20 feet away walking toward the other end of the lunchroom. The man was empty-handed. At Baker's command, the man turned and approached him. Truly, who had started up the stairs to the third floor ahead of Baker, returned to see what had delayed the patrolman. Baker asked Truly whether he knew the man in the lunchroom. Truly replied that the man worked in the building, whereupon Baker turned from the man and proceeded with Truly up the stairs. The man they encountered had started working in the Texas School Book Depository building on October 16, 1963. His fellow workers described him as very quiet, a loner. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. Within about one minute after his encounter with Baker and Truly, Oswald was seen passing through the second floor offices. In his hand was a full Coke bottle, which he had purchased from a vending machine in the lunchroom. He was walking toward the front of the building where a passenger elevator and a short flight of stairs provided access to the main entrance of the building on the first floor. Approximately seven minutes later, at about 12.40 p.m., Oswald boarded a bus at a point on Elm Street, seven short blocks east of the depository building. The bus was traveling west toward the very building from which Oswald had come. Its route lay through the Oak Cliff section in southwest Dallas, where it would pass seven blocks east of the rooming house in which Oswald was living at 1026 North Beckley Avenue. On the bus was Mrs. Mary Bledsoe, one of Oswald's former landladies who immediately recognized him. Oswald stayed on the bus approximately three or four minutes, during which time it proceeded only two blocks because of the traffic jam created by the motorcade and the assassination. Oswald then left the bus. A few minutes later, he entered a vacant taxi four blocks away and asked the driver to take him to a point on North Beckley Avenue, several blocks beyond his rooming house. The trip required five or six minutes. At about 1 p.m., Oswald arrived at the rooming house. The housekeeper, Mrs. Earlene Roberts, was surprised to see Oswald at midday and remarked to him that he seemed to be in quite a hurry. He made no reply. A few minutes later, Oswald emerged from his room, zipping up his jacket, and rushed out of the house. Approximately 14 minutes later and just 45 minutes after the assassination, another violent shooting occurred in Dallas. The victim was Patrolman J.D. Tippett of the Dallas Police, an officer with a good record during his more than 11 years with the police force. He was shot near the intersection of 10th Street and Patton Avenue, about nine-tenths of a mile from Oswald's rooming house. At the time of the assassination, Tippett was alone in his patrol car, the routine practice for most police patrol cars at this time of day. He had been ordered by radio at 12.45 p.m. to proceed to the central Oak Cliff area as part of a concentration of patrol car activity around the center of the city following the assassination. 
at 1254 Tippett Radio that he had moved as directed and would be available for any emergency. By this time, the police radio had broadcast several messages alerting the police to the suspect described by Brennan at the scene of the assassination, a slender white male, about 30 years old, 5 feet 10 inches, and weighing about 165 pounds. At approximately 1.15 p.m., Tippett was driving slowly in an easterly direction on East 10th Street in Oak Cliff, about 100 feet past the intersection of 10th Street and Patton Avenue, Tippett pulled up alongside a man walking in the same direction. The man met the general description of the suspect wanted in connection with the assassination. He walked over to Tippett's car, rested his arms on the door on the right-hand side of the car, and apparently exchanged words with Tippett through the window. Tippett opened the door on the left side and started to walk around the front of his car. As he reached the front wheel on the driver's side, the man on the sidewalk drew a revolver and fired several shots in rapid succession, hitting Tippett four times and killing him instantly. An automobile repairman, Domingo Benavides, heard the shots and stopped his pickup truck on the opposite side of the street, about 25 feet in front of Tippett's car. He observed the gunman start back toward Patton Avenue, removing the empty cartridge cases from the gun as he went. Benavides rushed to Tippett's side. The patrolman, apparently dead, was lying on his revolver, which was out of its holster. Benavides promptly reported the shooting to police headquarters over the radio in Tippett's car. The message was received shortly after 1.16 p.m. As the gunman left the scene, he walked hurriedly back toward Patton Avenue and turned left, heading south. Standing on the northwest corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue was Helen Markham, who had been walking south on Patton Avenue and had seen both the killer and Tippett cross the intersection in front of her as she waited on the curb for traffic to pass. She witnessed the shooting and then saw the man with a gun in his hand walk back toward the corner and cut across the lawn of the corner house as he started south on Patton Avenue. In the corner house itself, Mrs. Barbara Jeanette Davis and her sister-in-law, Mrs. Virginia Davis, heard the shots and rushed to the door in time to see the man walk rapidly across the lawn, shaking a revolver as if he were emptying it of cartridge cases. Later that day, each woman found a cartridge case near the house. As the gunman turned the corner, he passed alongside a taxi cab, which was parked on Patton Avenue a few feet from 10th Street. The driver, William W. Scoggins, had seen the slaying and was now crouched behind his cab on the street side. As the gunman cut through the shrubbery on the lawn, Scoggins looked up and saw the man approximately 12 feet away. In his hand was a pistol, and he muttered words which sounded to Scoggins like, Poor dumb cop, or poor damn cop. After passing Scoggins, the gunman crossed to the west side of Patton Avenue and ran south toward Jefferson Boulevard, a main Oak Cliff thoroughfare. On the east side of Patton, between 10th Street and Jefferson Boulevard, Ted Calloway, a used car salesman, heard the shots and ran to the sidewalk. As the man with the gun rushed past, Calloway shouted, What's going on? The man merely shrugged, ran on to Jefferson Boulevard, and turned right. On the next corner was a gas station with a parking lot in the rear. The assailant ran into the lot, discarded his jacket, and then continued his flight west on Jefferson. In a shoe store a few blocks farther west on Jefferson, the manager, Johnny Calvin Brewer, heard the siren of a police car moments after the radio in his store announced the shooting of the police officer in Oak Cliff. Brewer saw a man step quickly into the entranceway of the store and stand there with his back toward the street. When the police car made a U-turn and headed back in the direction of the tippet shooting, the man left and Brewer followed him. He saw the man enter the Texas Theater, a motion picture house about 60 feet away, without buying a ticket. 
Brewer pointed this out to the cashier, Mrs. Julia Postal, who called the police. The time was shortly after 1.40 p.m. At 1.29 p.m., the police radio had noted the similarity of the descriptions of the suspects in the Tippett shooting and the assassination. At 1.45 p.m., in response to Mrs. Postal's call, the police radio sounded the alarm, have information a suspect just went in the Texas theater. The house lights were then turned up. Patrolman M. N. McDonald and several other policemen approached the man who had been pointed out to them by Brewer. McDonald ordered the man to his feet and heard him say, Well, it's all over now. The man drew a gun from his waist with one hand and struck the officer with the other. McDonald struck out with his right hand and grabbed the gun with his left hand. After a brief struggle, McDonald and several other police officers disarmed and handcuffed the suspect and drove him to police headquarters, arriving at approximately 2 p.m. Following the assassination, Police cars had rushed to the Texas School Book Depository in response to the many radio messages reporting that the shots had been fired from the depository building. Inspector J. Herbert Sawyer of the Dallas Police Department arrived at the scene shortly after hearing the first of these police radio messages at 12.34 p.m. Some of the officers who had been assigned to the area of Elm and Houston streets for the motorcade were talking to witnesses and watching the building when Sawyer arrived. Sawyer entered the building and rode a passenger elevator to the fourth floor, which was the top floor for this elevator. He conducted a quick search, returned to the main floor, and between approximately 12.37 and 12.40 p.m., ordered that no one be permitted to leave the building. Shortly before 1 p.m., Captain J. Will Fritz, Chief of the Homicide and Robbery Bureau of the Dallas Police Department, arrived to take charge of the investigation. Searching the sixth floor, Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney noticed a pile of cartons in the southeast corner. He squeezed through the boxes and realized immediately that he had discovered the point from which the shots had been fired. On the floor were three empty cartridge cases. A carton had apparently been placed on the floor at the side of the window so that a person sitting on the carton could look down Elm Street toward the overpass and scarcely be noticed from the outside. Between this carton and the half-open window were three additional cartons arranged at such an angle that a rifle resting on the top carton would be aimed directly at the motorcade as it moved away from the building. The high stack of boxes, which first attracted Mooney's attention, effectively screened a person at the window from the view of anyone else on the floor. Mooney's discovery intensified the search for additional evidence on the sixth floor, and at 1.22 p.m., approximately 10 minutes after the cartridge cases were found, Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone turned his flashlight in the direction of two rows of boxes in the northwest corner near the staircase. Stuffed between the two rows was a bolt-action rifle with a telescopic sight. The rifle was not touched until it could be photographed. When Lt. J. C. Day of the Police Identification Bureau decided that the wooden stock and the metal knob at the end of the bolt contained no prints, he held the rifle by the stock while Captain Fritz ejected a live shell by operating the bolt. Lt. Day promptly noted that stamped on the rifle itself was the serial number C2766 as well as the markings 1940 made italy and cal 6.5 the rifle was about 40 inches long and when disassembled it could fit into a handmade paper sack which after the assassination was found in the southeast corner of the building within a few feet of the cartridge cases as Fritz and Day were completing their examination of this rifle on the sixth floor, Roy Truly, the building superintendent, approached with information which he felt should be brought to the attention of the police. Earlier, while the police were questioning the employees, Truly had observed that Lee Harvey Oswald, one of the 15 men who worked in the warehouse, was missing. 
After truly provided Oswald's name, address, and general description, Fritz left for police headquarters. He arrived at headquarters shortly after 2 p.m. and asked two detectives to pick up the employee who was missing from the Texas School Book Depository. Standing nearby were the police officers who had just arrived with the man arrested in the Texas theater. When Fritz mentioned the name of the missing employee, he learned that the man was already in the interrogation room. The missing school book depository employee and the suspect who had been apprehended in the Texas theater were one and the same, Lee Harvey Oswald. The suspect Fritz was about to question in connection with the assassination of the president and the murder of a policeman was born in New Orleans on October 18, 1939, two months after the death of his father. His mother, Marguerite Clavery Oswald, had two older children. One, John Pick, was a half-brother to Lee from an earlier marriage which had ended in divorce. The other was Robert Oswald, a full brother to Lee and five years older. When Lee Oswald was three, Mrs. Oswald placed him in an orphanage where his brother and half-brother were already living, primarily because she had to work. In January 1944, when Lee was four, he was taken out of the orphanage and shortly thereafter his mother moved with him to Dallas, Texas, where the older boys joined them at the end of the school year. In May of 1945, Marguerite Oswald married her third husband, Edwin A. Ekdahl. While the two older boys attended a military boarding school, Lee lived at home and developed a warm attachment to Ekdahl, occasionally accompanying his mother and stepfather on business trips around the country. Lee started school in Benbrook, Texas, but in the fall of 1946, after a separation from Ekdahl, Marguerite Oswald re-entered Lee in the first grade in Covington, Louisiana. In January 1947, while Lee was still in the first grade, the family moved to Fort Worth, Texas as the result of an attempted reconciliation between Ekdahl and Lee's mother. A year and a half later, before Lee was nine, his mother was divorced from her third husband as the result of a divorce action instituted by Ekdahl. Lee's school record during the next five and a half years in Fort Worth was average, although generally it grew poorer each year. The comments of teachers and others who knew him at that time do not reveal any unusual personality traits or characteristics. Another change for Lee Oswald occurred in August 1952, a few months after he completed the sixth grade. Marguerite Oswald and her 12-year-old son moved to New York City, where Marguerite's oldest son, John Pick, was stationed with the Coast Guard. The ensuing year and one half in New York was marked by Lee's refusals to attend school and by emotional and psychological problems of a seemingly serious nature. Because he had become a chronic school truant, Lee underwent psychiatric study at Youth House, an institution in New York for juveniles who have had truancy problems or difficulties with the law and who appear to require psychiatric observation or other types of guidance. The social worker assigned to his case described him as seriously detached and withdrawn and noted a rather pleasant, appealing quality about this emotionally starved, affectionless youngster. Lee expressed the feeling to the social worker that his mother did not care for him and regarded him as a burden. He experienced fantasies about being all-powerful and hurting people, but during his stay at Youth House, he was apparently not a behavior problem. He appeared withdrawn and evasive, a boy who preferred to spend his time alone reading and watching television. His tests indicated that he was above average in intelligence for his age group. The chief psychiatrist of Youth House diagnosed Lee's problem as a personality pattern disturbance with schizoid features and passive-aggressive tendencies. He concluded that the boy was an emotionally quite disturbed youngster and recommended treatment. 
in May 1953, after having been at Youth House for three weeks, Lee Oswald returned to school where his attendance and grades temporarily improved. By the following fall, however, the probation officer reported that virtually every teacher complained about the boy's behavior. His mother insisted that he did not need psychiatric assistance. Although there was apparently some improvement in Lee's behavior during the next few months, the court recommended further treatment. In January 1954, while Lee's case was still pending, Marguerite and Lee left for New Orleans, the city of Lee's birth. Upon his return to New Orleans, Lee maintained mediocre grades but had no obvious behavior problems. Neighbors and others who knew him outside of school remembered him as a quiet, solitary, and introverted boy who read a great deal and whose vocabulary made him quite articulate. About one month after he started the 10th grade and 11 days before his 16th birthday in October 1955, he brought to school a note purportedly written by his mother stating that the family was moving to California. The note was written by Lee. A few days later, he dropped out of school and almost immediately tried to join the Marine Corps. Because he was only 16, he was rejected. After leaving school, Lee worked for the next 10 months at several jobs in New Orleans as an office messenger or clerk. It was during this period that he started to read communist literature. Occasionally, in conversations with others, he praised communism and expressed to his fellow employees a desire to join the Communist Party. At about this time, when he was not yet 17, he wrote to the Socialist Party of America, professing his belief in Marxism. Another move followed in July 1956 when Lee and his mother returned to Fort Worth. He re-entered high school but again dropped out after a few weeks and enlisted in the Marine Corps on October 24, 1956, six days after his 17th birthday. On December 21, 1956, during boot camp in San Diego, Oswald fired a score of 212 for record with the M1 rifle, two points over the minimum for a rating of sharpshooter on a marksman sharpshooter expert scale. After his basic training, Oswald received training in aviation fundamentals and then in radar scanning. Most people who knew Oswald in the Marines described him as a loner who resented the exercise of authority by others. He spent much of his free time reading. He was court-martialed once for possessing an unregistered privately owned weapon and, on another occasion, for using provocative language to a non-commissioned officer. He was, however, generally able to comply with Marine discipline, even though his experiences in the Marine Corps did not live up to his expectations. Oswald served 15 months overseas until November 1958, most of it in Japan. During his final year in the Marine Corps, he was stationed for the most part in Santa Ana, California, where he showed a marked interest in the Soviet Union and sometimes expressed politically radical views with dogmatic conviction. Oswald again fired the M1 rifle for record on May 6, 1959, and this time he shot a score of 191 on a shorter course than before, only one point over the minimum required to be a marksman. According to one of his fellow Marines, Oswald was not particularly interested in his rifle performance and his unit was not expected to exhibit the usual rifle proficiency. During this period, he expressed strong admiration for Fidel Castro and an interest in joining the Cuban army. He tried to impress those around him as an intellectual, but his thinking appeared to some as shallow and rigid. Oswald's Marine service terminated on September 11, 1959, when, at his own request, he was released from active service a few months ahead of his scheduled release. He offered as the reason for his release the ill health and economic plight of his mother. He returned to Fort Worth, remained with his mother only three days, and left for New Orleans, telling his mother he planned to get work there in the shipping or import-export business. 
In New Orleans, he booked passage on the freighter SS Marion Likes, which sailed from New Orleans to Le Havre, France, on September 20, 1959. Lee Harvey Oswald had presumably planned this step in his life for quite some time. In March of 1959, he had applied to the Albert Schweitzer College in Switzerland for admission to the spring 1960 term. His letter of application contained many blatant falsehoods concerning his qualifications and background. A few weeks before his discharge, he had applied for and obtained a passport listing the Soviet Union as one of the countries which he planned to visit. During his service in the Marines, he had saved a comparatively large sum of money, possibly as much as $1,500, which would appear to have been accomplished by considerable frugality and apparently for a specific purpose. The purpose of the accumulated fund soon became known. On October 16, 1959, Oswald arrived in Moscow by train after crossing the border from Finland, where he had secured a visa for a six-day stay in the Soviet Union. He immediately applied for Soviet citizenship. On the afternoon of October 21, 1959, Oswald was ordered to leave the Soviet Union by 8 p.m. that evening. That same afternoon in his hotel room, Oswald in an apparent suicide attempt, slashed his left wrist. He was hospitalized immediately. On October 31st, three days after his release from the hospital, Oswald appeared at the American Embassy, announced that he wished to renounce his U.S. citizenship and become a Russian citizen, and handed the embassy officer a written statement he had prepared for the occasion. When asked his reasons, Oswald replied, I am a Marxist. Oswald never formally complied with the legal steps necessary to renounce his American citizenship. The Soviet government did not grant his request for citizenship, but in January 1960 he was given permission to remain in the Soviet Union on a year-to-year -year basis. At the same time, Oswald was sent to Minsk, where he worked in a radio factory as an unskilled laborer. In January 1961, his permission to remain in the Soviet Union was extended for another year. A few weeks later, in February 1961, he wrote to the American Embassy in Moscow expressing a desire to return to the United States. The following month, Oswald met a 19-year-old Russian girl, Marina Nikolaevna Prusakova, a pharmacist who had been brought up in Leningrad but was then living with an aunt and uncle in Minsk. They were married on April 30, 1961. Throughout the following year, he carried on a correspondence with American and Soviet authorities seeking approval for the departure of himself and his wife to the United States. In the course of this effort, Oswald and his wife visited the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in July of 1961. Primarily on the basis of an interview and questionnaire completed there, the embassy concluded that Oswald had not lost his citizenship, a decision subsequently ratified by the Department of State in Washington, D.C. Upon their return to Minsk, Oswald and his wife filed with the Soviet authorities for permission to leave together. Their formal application was made in July 1961, and on December 25, 1961, Marina Oswald was advised it would be granted. A daughter was born to the Oswalds in February 1962. In the months that followed, they prepared for the return to the United States. On May 9, 1962, the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, at the request of the Department of State, agreed to waive a restriction under the law which would have prevented the issuance of a United States visa to Oswald's Russian wife until she had left the Soviet Union. They finally left Moscow on June 1, 1962, and were assisted in meeting their travel expenses by a loan of $435.71 from the U.S. Department of State. 
Two weeks later, they arrived in Fort Worth, Texas. For a few weeks, his wife and child lived with Oswald's brother, Robert. After a similar stay with Oswald's mother, they moved into their own apartment in early August. Oswald obtained a job on July 16th as a sheet metal worker. During this period in Fort Worth, Oswald was interviewed twice by agents of the FBI. The report of their first interview, which occurred on June 26th, described him as arrogant and unwilling to discuss the reasons why he had gone to the Soviet Union. Oswald denied that he was involved in Soviet intelligence activities and promised to advise the FBI if Soviet representatives ever communicated with him. He was interviewed again on August 16th when he displayed a less belligerent attitude and once again agreed to inform the FBI of any attempt to enlist him in intelligence activities. In early October 1962, Oswald quit his job at the sheet metal plant and moved to Dallas. While living in Fort Worth, the Oswalds had been introduced to a group of Russian-speaking people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Many of them assisted the Oswalds by providing small amounts of food, clothing, and household items. Oswald himself was disliked by almost all of the group whose help to the family was prompted primarily by sympathy for Marina Oswald and the child. Despite the fact that he had left the Soviet Union disillusioned with its government, Oswald seemed more firmly committed than ever to his concepts of Marxism. He showed disdain for democracy, capitalism, and American society in general. He was highly critical of the Russian-speaking group because they seemed devoted to American concepts of democracy and capitalism and were ambitious to improve themselves economically. In February 1963, the Oswalds met Ruth Payne at a social gathering. Ruth Payne was temporarily separated from her husband and living with her two children in their home in Irving, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Because of an interest in the Russian language and sympathy for Marina Oswald, who spoke no English and had little funds, Ruth Payne befriended Marina and during the next two months visited her on several occasions. On April 6, 1963, Oswald lost his job with a photography firm. A few days later, on April 10th, he attempted to kill Major General Edwin A. Walker, resigned U.S. Army, using a rifle which he had ordered by mail one month previously under an assumed name. Marina Oswald learned of her husband's act when she confronted him with a note which he had left, giving her instructions in the event he did not return. That incident and their general economic difficulties impelled Marina Oswald to suggest that her husband leave Dallas and go to New Orleans to look for work. Oswald left for New Orleans on April 24, 1963. Ruth Payne, who knew nothing of the Walker shooting, invited Marina Oswald and the baby to stay with her in the Payne's modest house while Oswald sought work in New Orleans. Early in May, upon receiving word from Oswald that he had found a job, Ruth Payne drove Marina Oswald and the baby to New Orleans to rejoin Oswald. During the stay in New Orleans, Oswald formed a fictitious New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He posed as secretary of this organization and represented that the president was A.J. Heidel. In reality, Heidel was a completely fictitious person created by Oswald, the organization's only member. Oswald was arrested on August 9th in connection with a scuffle which occurred while he was distributing pro-Castro leaflets. The next day, while at the police station, he was interviewed by an FBI agent after Oswald requested the police to arrange such an interview. Oswald gave the agent false information about his own background and was evasive in his replies concerning fair play for Cuba activities. During the next two weeks, Oswald appeared on radio programs twice claiming to be the spokesman for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. 
On July 19, 1963, Oswald lost his job as a greaser of coffee processing machinery. In September, after an exchange of correspondence with Marina Oswald, Ruth Payne drove to New Orleans and on September 23rd, transported Marina, the child, and the family belongings to Irving, Texas. Ruth Payne suggested that Marina Oswald, who was expecting her second child in October, live at the Payne house until after the baby was born. Oswald remained behind, ostensibly to find work either in Houston or some other city. Instead, he departed by bus for Mexico, arriving in Mexico City on September 27th, where he promptly visited the Cuban and Russian embassies. His stated objective was to obtain official permission to visit Cuba on his way to the Soviet Union. The Cuban government would not grant his visa unless the Soviet government would also issue a visa permitting his entry into Russia. Oswald's efforts to secure these visas failed and he left for Dallas where he arrived on October 3, 1963. When he saw his wife the next day, it was decided that Oswald would rent a room in Dallas and visit his family on weekends. For one week, he rented a room from Mrs. Bledsoe, the woman who later saw him on the bus shortly after the assassination. On October 14, 1963, he rented the Beckley Avenue room and listed his name as O. H. Lee. On the same day, at the suggestion of a neighbor, Mrs. Payne phoned the Texas School Book Depository and was told that there was a job opening. She informed Oswald, who was interviewed the following day at the depository and started to work there on October 16, 1963. On October 20th, the Oswald's second daughter was born. During October and November, Oswald established a general pattern of weekend visits to Irving, arriving on Friday afternoon and returning to Dallas Monday morning with a fellow employee, Buell Wesley Frazier, who lived near the Paines. On Friday, November 15th, Oswald remained in Dallas at the suggestion of his wife, who told him that the house would be crowded because of a birthday party for Ruth Payne's daughter. On Monday, November 18th, Oswald and his wife quarreled bitterly during a telephone conversation because she learned for the first time that he was living at the rooming house under an assumed name. On Thursday, November 21st, Oswald told Frazier that he would like to drive to Irving to pick up some curtain rods for an apartment in Dallas. His wife and Mrs. Payne were quite surprised to see him since it was a Thursday night. They thought he had returned to make up after Monday's quarrel. He was conciliatory, but Marina Oswald was still angry. Later that evening, when Mrs. Payne had finished cleaning the kitchen, she went into the garage and noticed that the light was burning. She was certain that she had not left it on, although the incident appeared unimportant at the time. In the garage were most of the Oswald's personal possessions. The following morning, Oswald left while his wife was still in bed, feeding the baby. She did not see him leave the house, nor did Ruth Payne. On the dresser in the room, he left his wedding ring, which he had never done before. His wallet containing $170 was left intact in a dresser drawer. Oswald walked to Fraser's house about a half a block away and placed a long, bulky package made out of wrapping paper and tape into the rear seat of the car. He told Fraser that the package contained curtain rods. When they reached the depository parking lot, Oswald walked quickly ahead. Fraser followed and saw Oswald enter the depository building, carrying the long, bulky package with him. During the morning of November 22nd, Marina Oswald followed President Kennedy's activities on television. She and Ruth Payne cried when they heard that the president had been shot. Ruth Payne translated the news of the shooting to Marina Oswald as it came over television, including the report that the shots were probably fired from the building where Oswald worked. When Marina Oswald heard this, she recalled the Walker episode and the fact that her husband still owned the rifle. She went quietly to the Payne's garage where the rifle had been concealed in a blanket among other belongings. 
it appeared to her that the rifle was still there, although she did not actually open the blanket. At about 3 p.m., the police arrived at the Payne house and asked Marina Oswald whether her husband owned a rifle. She said that he did and then led them into the garage and pointed to the rolled up blanket. As a police officer lifted it, the blanket hung limply over either side of his arm. The rifle was not there. Meanwhile, at police headquarters, Captain Fritz had begun questioning Oswald. Soon after the start of the first interrogation, agents of the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service arrived and participated in the questioning. Oswald denied having anything to do with the assassination of President Kennedy or the murder of Patrolman Tippett. He claimed that he was eating lunch at the time of the assassination and then spoke with his foreman for five to ten minutes before going home. He denied that he owned a rifle and when confronted in a subsequent interview with a picture showing him holding a rifle and pistol, he claimed that his face had been superimposed on someone else's body. He refused to answer any questions about the presence in his wallet of a selective service card with his picture and the name Alec J. Heidel. During the questioning of Oswald on the third floor of the police department, more than 100 representatives of the press, radio, and television were crowded into the hallway through which Oswald had to pass when being taken from his cell to Captain Fritz's office for interrogation. Reporters tried to interview Oswald during these trips. Between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning, he appeared in the hallway at least 16 times. The general confused conditions outside and inside Captain Fritz's office increased the difficulty of police questioning. Advised by the police that he could communicate with an attorney, Oswald made several telephone calls on Saturday in an effort to procure representation of his own choice and discuss the matter with the president of the local bar association who offered to obtain counsel. Oswald declined the offer, saying that he would first try to obtain counsel by himself. By Sunday morning, he had not yet engaged an attorney. At 7.10 p.m. on November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was formally advised that he had been charged with the murder of Patrolman J.D. Tippett. Several witnesses to the Tippett slaying and to the subsequent flight of the gunman had positively identified Oswald in police lineups. While positive firearm identification evidence was not available at the time, the revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest was of a type which could have fired the shots that killed Tippett. The formal charge against Oswald for the assassination of President Kennedy was lodged shortly after 1.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 23rd. By 10 p.m. of the day of the assassination, the FBI had traced the rifle found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository to a mail order house in Chicago which had purchased it from a distributor in New York. Approximately six hours later, the Chicago firm advised that this rifle had been ordered in March 1963 by an A. Heidel for shipment to post office box 2915 in Dallas, Texas, a box rented by Oswald. Payment for this rifle was remitted by a money order signed by A. Heidel. By 6.45 p.m. on November 23rd, the FBI was able to advise the Dallas police that, as a result of handwriting analysis of the documents used to purchase the rifle, it had concluded that the rifle had been ordered by Lee Harvey Oswald. Throughout Friday and Saturday, the Dallas police released to the public many of the details concerning the alleged evidence against Oswald. Police officials discussed important aspects of the case, usually in the course of impromptu and confused press conferences in the third floor corridor. Some of the information divulged was erroneous. Efforts by the news media representatives to reconstruct the crime and promptly report details frequently led to erroneous and often conflicting reports. At the urgings of the newsmen, Chief of Police Jesse E. Curry brought Oswald to a press conference in the police assembly room shortly after midnight of the day Oswald was arrested. 
The assembly room was crowded with newsmen who had come to Dallas from all over the country. They shouted questions at Oswald and flashed cameras at him. Among this group was a 52-year-old Dallas nightclub operator, Jack Ruby. On Sunday morning, November 24th, arrangements were made for Oswald's transfer from the city jail to the Dallas County Jail about one mile away. The news media had been informed on Saturday night that the transfer of Oswald would not take place until after 10 a.m. on Sunday. Earlier on Sunday, between 2.30 and 3 a.m., anonymous telephone calls threatening Oswald's life had been received by the Dallas office of the FBI and by the office of the county sheriff. Nevertheless, on Sunday morning, television, radio, and newspaper representatives crowded into the basement to record the transfer. As viewed through television cameras, Oswald would emerge from a door in front of the cameras and proceed to the transfer vehicle. To the right of the cameras was a down ramp from Main Street on the north. To the left was an up ramp leading to Commerce Street on the south. The armored truck in which Oswald was to be transferred arrived shortly after 11 a.m. Police officials then decided, however, that an unmarked police car would be preferable for the trip because of its greater speed and maneuverability. At approximately 11.20 a.m., Oswald emerged from the basement jail office, flanked by detectives on either side and at his rear. He took a few steps towards the car and was in the glaring light of the television cameras when a man suddenly darted out from an area on the right of the cameras where newsmen had been assembled. The man was carrying a Colt 38 revolver in his right hand, and while millions watched on television, he moved quickly to within a few feet of Oswald and fired one shot into Oswald's abdomen. Oswald groaned with pain as he fell to the ground and quickly lost consciousness. Within seven minutes, Oswald was at Parkland Hospital where, without having regained consciousness, he was pronounced dead at 1.07 p.m. The man who killed Oswald was Jack Ruby. He was instantly arrested and minutes later confined in a cell on the fifth floor of the Dallas Police Jail. Under interrogation, he denied that the killing of Oswald was in any way connected with a conspiracy involving the assassination of President Kennedy. He maintained that he had killed Oswald in a temporary fit of depression and rage over the president's death. Ruby was transferred the following day to the county jail without notice to the press or to police officers not directly involved in the transfer indicted for the murder of Oswald by the state of Texas on November 26, 1963. Ruby was found guilty on March 14, 1964 and sentenced to death. As of September 1964, his case was pending on appeal. Conclusions This commission was created to ascertain the facts relating to the preceding summary of events and to consider the important questions which they raised. The commission has addressed itself to this task and has reached certain conclusions based on all the available evidence. No limitations have been placed on the commission's inquiry. It has conducted its own investigation and all government agencies have fully discharged the responsibility to cooperate with the Commission in its investigation. These conclusions represent the reasoned judgment of all members of the Commission and are presented after an investigation which has satisfied the Commission that it has ascertained the truth concerning the assassination of President Kennedy to the extent that a prolonged and thorough search makes this possible. The shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly were fired from the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. This determination is based on the following. A. Witnesses at the scene of the assassination saw a rifle being fired from the sixth floor window of the depository building, and some witnesses saw a rifle in the window immediately after the shots were fired. B. 
the nearly whole bullet found on Governor Connolly's stretcher at Parkland Memorial Hospital and the two bullet fragments found in the front seat of the presidential limousine were fired from the 6.5 millimeter man liquor carcano rifle found on the sixth floor of the depository building to the exclusion of all other weapons c the three used cartridge cases found near the window on the sixth floor at the southeast corner of the building were fired from the same rifle which fired the above described bullet and fragments to the exclusion of all other weapons. D. The windshield in the presidential limousine was struck by a bullet fragment on the inside surface of the glass, but was not penetrated. E. The nature of the bullet wound suffered by President Kennedy and Governor Connolly and the location of the car at the time of the shots established that the bullets were fired from above and behind the presidential limousine, striking the president and the governor as follows. 1. President Kennedy was first struck by a bullet which entered at the back of his neck and exited through the lower front portion of his neck, causing a wound which would not necessarily have been lethal. The president was struck a second time by a bullet which entered the right rear portion of his head, causing a massive and fatal wound. 2. Governor Connolly was struck by a bullet which entered on the right side of his back and traveled downward through the right side of his chest, exiting below his right nipple. This bullet then passed through his right wrist and entered his left thigh where it caused a superficial wound. F. There is no credible evidence that the shots were fired from the triple underpass ahead of the motorcade or from any other location. 2. The weight of the evidence indicates that there were three shots fired. 3. Although it is not necessary to any essential findings of the commission to determine just which shot hit Governor Connolly, there is very persuasive evidence from the experts to indicate that the same bullet which pierced the president's throat also caused Governor Connolly's wounds. However, Governor Connolly's testimony and certain other factors have given rise to some difference of opinion as to this probability, but there is no question in the mind of any member of the commission that all the shots which caused the President's and Governor Connolly's wounds were fired from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. The shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. This conclusion is based upon the following. A. The Man Liquor Carcano 6.5 mm Italian rifle from which the shots were fired was owned by and in the possession of Oswald. B. Oswald carried this rifle into the depository building on the morning of November 22, 1963. C. Oswald, at the time of the assassination, was present at the window from which the shots were fired. D. Shortly after the assassination, the man liquor Carcano rifle belonging to Oswald was found partially hidden between some cartons on the sixth floor, and the improvised paper bag in which Oswald brought the rifle to the depository was found close by the window from which the shots were fired. E. Based on testimony of the experts and their analysis of films of the assassination, the Commission has concluded that a rifleman of Lee Harvey Oswald's capabilities could have fired the shots from the rifle used in the assassination within the elapsed time of the shooting. The Commission has concluded further that Oswald possessed the capability with a rifle which enabled him to commit the assassination. F. Oswald lied to the police after his arrest concerning important substantive matters. G. Oswald had attempted to kill Major General Edwin A. Walker, resigned U.S. Army, on April 10, 1963, thereby demonstrating his disposition to take human life. 5. Oswald killed Dallas Police Patrolman J.D. Tippett approximately 45 minutes after the assassination. This conclusion upholds the finding that Oswald fired the shots which killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly and is supported by the following. A. 
two eyewitnesses saw the tippet shooting and seven eyewitnesses heard the shots and saw the gunman leave the scene with revolver in hand. These nine eyewitnesses positively identified Lee Harvey Oswald as the man they saw. B. The cartridge cases found at the scene of the shooting were fired from the revolver in the possession of Oswald at the time of his arrest to the exclusion of all other weapons. C. The revolver in Oswald's possession at the time of his arrest was purchased by and belonged to Oswald. D. Oswald's jacket was found along the path of flight taken by the gunman as he fled from the scene of the killing. 6. Within 80 minutes of the assassination and 35 minutes of the tippet killing, Oswald resisted arrest at the theater by attempting to shoot another Dallas police officer. 7. The commission has reached the following conclusions concerning Oswald's interrogation and detention by the Dallas police. A. Except for the force required to effect his arrest, Oswald was not subjected to any physical coercion by any law enforcement officials. He was advised that he could not be compelled to give any information and that any statement made by him might be used against him in court. He was advised of his right to counsel. He was given the opportunity to obtain counsel of his own choice and was offered legal assistance by the Dallas Bar Association, which he rejected at the time. B. Newspaper, radio, and television reporters were allowed uninhibited access to the area through which Oswald had to pass when he was moved from his cell to the interrogation room and other sections of the building, thereby subjecting Oswald to harassment and creating chaotic conditions which were not conducive to orderly interrogation or the protection of the rights of the prisoner. C. The numerous statements, sometimes erroneous, made to the press by various local law enforcement officials during this period of confusion and disorder in the police station would have presented serious obstacles to the obtaining of a fair trial for Oswald. To the extent that the information was erroneous or misleading, it helped to create doubts, speculations, and fears in the minds of the public which might otherwise not have arisen. 8. The Commission has reached the following conclusions concerning the killing of Oswald by Jack Ruby on November 24, 1963. A. Ruby entered the basement of the Dallas Police Department shortly after 11.17 a.m. and killed Lee Harvey Oswald at 11.21 a.m. B. Although the evidence on Ruby's means of entry is not conclusive, the weight of the evidence indicates that he walked down the ramp leading from Main Street to the basement of the police department. C. There is no evidence to support the rumor that Ruby may have been assisted by any members of the Dallas Police Department in the killing of Oswald. D. The Dallas Police Department's decision to transfer Oswald to the county jail in full public view was unsound. The arrangements made by the police department on Sunday morning only a few hours before the attempted transfer were inadequate. Of critical importance was the fact that the news media representatives and others were not excluded from the basement even after the police were notified of threats to Oswald's life. These deficiencies contributed to the death of Lee Harvey Oswald. 9. The Commission has found no evidence that either Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby was part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign, to assassinate President Kennedy. The reasons for this conclusion are A. The Commission has found no evidence that anyone assisted Oswald in planning or carrying out the assassination. In this connection, it has thoroughly investigated, among other factors, the circumstances surrounding the planning of the motorcade route through Dallas, the hiring of Oswald by the Texas School Book Depository Company on October 15, 1963, the method by which the rifle was brought into the building, the placing of cartons of books at the window, Oswald's escape from the building, and the testimony of eyewitnesses to the shooting. B. The Commission has found no evidence that Oswald was involved with any person or group in a conspiracy to assassinate the President, although it has thoroughly investigated, in addition to other possible leads, 
all facets of Oswald's associations, finances, and personal habits, particularly during the period following his return from the Soviet Union in June 1962. C. The Commission has found no evidence to show that Oswald was employed, persuaded, or encouraged by any foreign government to assassinate President Kennedy or that he was an agent of any foreign government. Although the Commission has reviewed the circumstances surrounding Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union, his life there from October of 1959 to June of 1962, so far as it can be reconstructed, his known contacts with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee and his visits to the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City during his trip to Mexico from September 26th to October 3rd, 1963, and his known contacts with the Soviet Embassy in the United States. D. The Commission has explored all attempts of Oswald to identify himself with various political groups, including the Communist Party USA, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and the Socialist Workers Party, and has been unable to find any evidence that the contacts which he initiated were related to Oswald's subsequent assassination of the President. E. All of the evidence before the Commission established that there was nothing to support the speculation that Oswald was an agent, employee, or informant of the FBI, the CIA, or any other governmental agency. It has thoroughly investigated Oswald's relationships prior to the assassination with all agencies of the U.S. government. All contacts with Oswald by any of these agencies were made in the regular exercise of their different responsibilities. F. No direct or indirect relationship between Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby has been discovered by the Commission, nor has it been able to find any credible evidence that either knew the other. Although a thorough investigation was made of the many rumors and speculations of such a relationship. G. The Commission has found no evidence that Jack Ruby acted with any other person in the killing of Lee Harvey Oswald. H. After careful investigation, the Commission has found no credible evidence that either Ruby and Officer Tippett, who was killed by Oswald, knew each other or that Oswald and Tippett knew each other. Because of the difficulty of proving negatives to a certainty, the possibility of others being involved with either Oswald or Ruby cannot be established categorically, but if there is any such evidence, it has been beyond the reach of all the investigative agencies and resources of the United States and has not come to the attention of this Commission. 10. In its entire investigation, the Commission has found no evidence of conspiracy, subversion, or disloyalty to the U.S. government by any federal, state, or local official. 11. On the basis of the evidence before the Commission, it concludes that Oswald acted alone. Therefore, to determine the motives for the assassination of President Kennedy, one must look to the assassin himself. Clues to Oswald's motives can be found in his family history, his education or lack of it, his acts, his writings, and the recollections of those who had close contacts with him throughout his life. The Commission has presented with this report all of the background information bearing on motivation which it could discover. Thus, others may study Lee Oswald's life and arrive at their own conclusions as to his possible motives. The Commission could not make any definitive determination of Oswald's motives. It has endeavored to isolate factors which contributed to his character and which might have influenced his decision to assassinate President Kennedy. These factors were a. His deep-rooted resentment of all authority which was expressed in a hostility toward every society in which he lived. b. His inability to enter into meaningful relationships with people and a continuous pattern of rejecting his environment in favor of new surroundings. C. His urge to try to find a place in history and despair at times over failure in his various undertakings. D. His capacity for violence was evidenced by his attempt to kill General Walker. 
E. His avowed commitment to Marxism and communism as he understood the terms and developed his own interpretation of them. This was expressed by his antagonism toward the United States, by his defection to the Soviet Union, by his failure to be reconciled with life in the United States, even after his disenchantment with the Soviet Union, and by his efforts, though frustrated, to go to Cuba. Each of these contributed to his capacity to risk all in cruel and irresponsible actions. 12. The Commission recognizes that the varied responsibilities of the President require that he make frequent trips to all parts of the United States and abroad. Consistent with their high responsibilities, Presidents can never be protected from every potential threat. The Secret Service's difficulty in meeting its protective responsibility varies with the activities and the nature of the occupant of the office of President and his willingness to conform to plans for his safety. In appraising the performance of the Secret Service, it should be understood that it has to do its work within such limitations. Nevertheless, the Commission believes the recommendations for improvements in presidential protection are compelled by the facts disclosed in this investigation. A. The complexities of the presidency have increased so rapidly in recent years that the Secret Service has not been able to develop or to secure adequate resources of personnel and facilities to fulfill its important assignment. This situation should be promptly remedied. B. The Commission has concluded that the criteria and procedures of the Secret Service designed to identify and protect against persons considered threats to the President were not adequate prior to the assassination. 1. The Protective Research Section of the Secret Service, which is responsible for its preventive work, lacks sufficiently trained personnel and the mechanical and technical assistance needed to fulfill its responsibility. 2. Prior to the assassination, the Secret Service's criteria dealt with direct threats against the President. Although the Secret Service treated the direct threats against the President adequately, it failed to recognize the necessity of identifying other potential sources of danger to his security. The Secret Service did not develop adequate and specific criteria defining those persons or groups who might present a danger to the President. In effect, the Secret Service largely relied upon other federal or state agencies to supply the information necessary for it to fulfill its preventive responsibilities, although it did ask for information about direct threats to the President. C. The Commission has concluded that there was insufficient liaison and coordination of information between the Secret Service and other federal agencies necessarily concerned with presidential protection. Although the FBI, in the normal exercise of its responsibility, had secured considerable information about Lee Harvey Oswald, it had no official responsibility under the Secret Service criteria existing at the time of the President's trip to Dallas to refer to the Secret Service the information it had about Oswald. The Commission has concluded, however, that the FBI took an unduly restrictive view of its role in preventive intelligence work prior to the assassination. A more carefully coordinated treatment of the Oswald case by the FBI might well have resulted in bringing Oswald's activities to the attention of the Secret Service. D. The Commission has concluded that some of the advanced preparations in Dallas made by the Secret Service such as the detailed security measures taken at Love Field and the trademark were thorough and well executed. In other respects, however, the Commission has concluded that the advanced preparations for the President's trip were deficient. 1. Although the Secret Service is compelled to rely to a great extent on local law enforcement officials, its procedures at the time of the Dallas trip did not call for well-defined instructions as to the respective responsibilities of the police officials and others assisting in the protection of the President. 2. The procedures relied upon by the Secret Service for detecting the presence of an assassin located in a building along a motorcade route were inadequate. At the time of the trip to Dallas, 
the Secret Service, as a matter of practice, did not investigate or cause to be checked any building located along the motorcade route to be taken by the President. The responsibility for observing windows in these buildings during the motorcade was divided between local police personnel stationed on the streets to regulate crowds and Secret Service agents riding in the motorcade. Based on its investigation, the Commission has concluded that these arrangements during the trip to Dallas were clearly not sufficient. E. The configuration of the presidential car and the seating arrangements of the Secret Service agents in the car did not afford the Secret Service agents the opportunity, should they have had, to be of immediate assistance to the President at the first sign of danger. F. Within these limitations, however, the Commission finds that the agents most immediately responsible for the President's safety reacted promptly at the time the shots were fired from the Texas School Book Depository Building. Recommendations. Prompted by the assassination of President Kennedy, the Secret Service has initiated a comprehensive and critical review of its total operations. As a result of studies concluded during the past several months and in cooperation with this commission, the Secret Service has prepared a planning document dated August 27, 1964, which recommends various programs considered necessary by the service to improve its technique and enlarge its resources. The Commission is encouraged by the efforts taken by the Secret Service since the assassination and suggests the following recommendations. 1. A committee of cabinet members including the Secretary of the Treasury and the Attorney General or the National Security Council should be assigned the responsibility of reviewing and overseeing the protective activities of the Secret Service and other federal agencies that assist in safeguarding the President. Once given this responsibility, such a committee would ensure that the maximum resources of the federal government are fully engaged in the task of protecting the President and would provide guidance in defining the general nature of domestic and foreign dangers to presidential security. Two, suggestions have been advanced to the Commission for the transfer of all or parts of the presidential protective responsibilities of the Secret Service to some other department or agency. The Commission believes that if there is to be any determination of whether or not to relocate these responsibilities and functions, it ought to be made by the Executive and the Congress, perhaps upon recommendations based on studies by the previously suggested committee. 3. Meanwhile, in order to improve daily supervision of the Secret Service within the Department of the Treasury, the Commission recommends that the Secretary of the Treasury appoint a special assistant with the responsibility of supervising the Secret Service. This special assistant should have sufficient stature and experience in law enforcement, intelligence, and allied fields to provide effective continuing supervision and to keep the Secretary fully informed regarding the performance of the Secret Service. One of the initial assignments of this special assistant should be the supervision of the current effort by the Secret Service to revise and modernize its basic operating procedures. 4. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service completely overhaul its facilities devoted to the advanced detection of potential threats against the President. The Commission suggests the following measures. A. The Secret Service should develop as quickly as possible more useful and precise criteria defining those potential threats to the President which should be brought to its attention by other agencies. The criteria should, among other additions, provide for prompt notice to the Secret Service of all return defectors. B. The Secret Service should expedite its current plans to utilize the most efficient data processing techniques. C. Once the Secret Service has formulated new criteria delineating the information it desires, it should enter into agreements with each federal agency to ensure its receipt of such information. 5. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service improve the protective measures followed in the planning and conducting of presidential motorcades. In particular, the Secret Service should continue its current efforts to increase its precautionary attention given to buildings along the motorcade route. 6. 
the Commission recommends that the Secret Service continue its recent efforts to improve and formalize its relationships with local police departments and areas to be visited by the President. 7. The Commission believes that when the new criteria and procedures are established, the Secret Service will not have sufficient personnel or adequate facilities. The Commission recommends that the Secret Service be provided with the personnel and resources which the Service and the Department of the Treasury may be able to demonstrate are needed to fulfill its important mission. 8. Even with an increase in Secret Service personnel, the protection of the President will continue to require the resources and cooperation of many federal agencies. The Commission recommends that these agencies, specifically the FBI, continue to practice as it has developed, particularly since the assassination, of assisting the Secret Service upon request by providing personnel or other aid, and that there be a closer association and liaison between the Secret Service and all federal agencies. 9. The Commission recommends that the President's physician always accompany him during his travels and occupy a position near the President where he can be immediately available in case of any emergency. 10. The Commission recommends to Congress that it adopt legislation which would make the assassination of the President and Vice President a federal crime. A state of affairs where U.S. authorities have no clearly defined jurisdiction to investigate the assassination of a president is anomalous. 11. The Commission has examined the Department of State's handling of the Oswald matters and finds that it followed the law throughout. However, the Commission believes that the Department, in accordance with its own regulations, should in all cases exercise great care in the return to this country of defectors who have evidenced disloyalty or hostility to this country or who have expressed a desire to renounce their American citizenship and that when such persons are so returned, procedures should be adopted for the better dissemination of information concerning them to the intelligence agencies of the government. 12. The Commission recommends that the representatives of the bar, law enforcement associations, and the news media work together to establish ethical standards concerning the collection and presentation of information to the public so that there will be no interference with pending criminal investigations, court proceedings, or the right of individuals to a fair trial.